Okay, welcome class. It's uh, good to have you back for the video. What we're going to do is start with this video, which will be finishing uh, the material from chapter 17 and uh, starting where we left off in class. And then I'm going to have a second video that we'll post, which will be a review of the practice exam for going through the key and then I'll be explaining things to you. So we'll have two videos, one that will be chapter 17, uh, the remaining part, which I'm going to finish right now. And then there will be a second video that will go through the review for chapter 17. They will be separate videos so that you can access them separately and don't have to scroll through one to get to the other. So anyway, let's go ahead with the material, uh, finish off the material for chapter 17. Uh, the place we left off in class uh, earlier today, by the way, it's for me, it's Tuesday. I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this, but uh, today's Tuesday for me, Tuesday afternoon. And uh, the place we left off was talking about introns. And let's just briefly review what those are. Introns are the segments that get transcribed into an RNA. In other words, the, if you think of a, the DNA in a gene, the whole gene gets transcribed from beginning to end. Then it has a five prime cap put on, a poly A tail on the three prime end. And then the introns get cut out the exons splice together. And for many genes, introns occupy up to as much as 90% of the gene in some cases, so that the messenger RNA, when it's finally processed, fully processed, and then exported out of the nucleus is quite a bit smaller than it originally was when it was transcribed. And so this uh, talks about intervening sequences, which are introns. Exons are the parts that uh, are that will remain in the functional messenger RNA, and of course then contain the reading frame. And then RNA splicing is the process that removes the introns and splices the exons together to give you the, the final mRNA. And here's a diagrammatic representation of it. So what this is, by the way, is an example of one of the simplest genes in humans. This is the gene that encodes beta globin, which is one of the protein subunits of, of uh, functional hemoglobin. And uh, you'll notice that it has the five prime cap on one end, and then there's an exon that's about 30 nucleotides long. There's a very small intron here, which by the way, it lies entirely within the uh, five prime untranslated sequence or five prime UTR, which means that the start codon, even though it's not indicated on here, is somewhere up in here. And then there, or excuse me, not in here, it's up in here. And then there's the first exon, and then there's a very large intron that gets cut out of right out of the middle of the reading frame. And in, in fact, splicing introns or splicing exons after intron removal has to be very exact. It has to be nucleotide for nucleotide. And it's a very exact cut that, that the cell makes. And why did that cut out on me? Um, let's get back here. The, uh, it has to be a very exact cuts at these sites to take out that intron, splice the exons together, and then ultimately you have the exons spliced together. The reading frame then lies right in here where those lines are, 1 to 146. Those are the 146 codons that constitute the reading frame of the protein, the 5 prime UTR, and the 3 prime UTR, 5 prime cap poly A tail in the final messenger RNA. Now, uh, uh, we won't take a lot of time on this, uh, but this, the rest of uh, the next slides here talk about the mechanism for splicing. That's, to me, not as important as understanding what the final product is. So we'll go through this very quickly. The, uh, the whole process is made up of what are called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRNPs, small nuclear ribonucleic acids, or small nuclear RNAs, and they combine together to form what is uh, uh, called the spliceosome, which will come in and remove the intron. There are other proteins involved in it. And essentially what they do is they bring the ends of the intron together, together with a part that they bind with that's in the middle of the intron. And then they form what is sometimes called a lariat. That is, it takes the end of one, one end of the intron the three prime end attaches it to the middle part of the intron and then leaves the, the uh, uh, actually it's the five prime end of the intron, leaves the three prime end over here and then cuts the two of them out and splices the messenger RNA together. And uh, one of the discoveries that came out of this was the fact that 
We think of enzymes usually as consisting of protein, but there are some examples of enzymes that are made up of RNA, and this is one of them. Ribozymes are a type of enzyme that is RNA, and in the spliceosome complex, ribosomes can carry out an enzymatic function. So this is one of the exceptions in which an enzyme may not be made up of protein, but is, is made of RNA. The, uh, uh, another thing that can happen with RNA is it can form a three-dimensional structure. What it will do is single-stranded RNAs can come together, they can form base pairs with themselves, with the single-stranded RNA can loop up. And that happens actually in the, these ribozymes that, that carry out the splicing reactions. Now, I, we talked in class a little bit about this concept. Sorry about that. This, uh, the, the screen saver for this screen shuts it off too quickly. So uh, uh, yeah. this will probably happen a couple of times as we're going along here, but I'll keep working on it. Anyway, we talked about this a little earlier in class that uh, there is a type of splicing that's called alternative splicing, which means that genes can encode more than one protein. And essentially what's going on here is that in some tissues, they might use uh, introns as exons in one tissue, whereas in another tissue, the, what were introns in one tissue may be exons in another. And what that does is it allows the same gene to encode different proteins that are related to one another. And one of the examples I gave is a protein that is a myosin protein that's used in, in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. It's a slightly different protein in skeletal muscle than it is in cardiac muscle. And the difference is they come from the same gene, but alternative splicing of introns and exons creates a different protein. Now, proteins also have regions in them that are called domains. These are functional regions that may carry out a particular function. For instance, we talked about, and in your practice exam, you will see the androgen receptor protein. That has several different domains in it. One of them is a DNA binding domain, where it functions as a transcription factor by binding to DNA. Another domain in it is the receptor domain for testosterone where testosterone binds to the protein that activates it, it can then go on and bind to DNA where it then activates genes. So it has these two different binding domains in it. One of them is the steroid receptor, the other one is the DNA binding domain. And domains are regions of a protein that then carry out a particular function. Here's uh, an example of, uh, of the uh, process of, of different domains sometimes are localized within specific exons. This is a little bit oversimplified because sometimes the domain may expand to exons and even have an intron in between it. But oftentimes exons carry functional domains. Where that's important in evolution is that sometimes genes may rearrange themselves to make new genes. You get two genes that may come together within an intron to form yet a new gene that brings functional domains together in a new, uh, in a new arrangement. And we find this process in, in evolution going on. And the introns allow for that bringing, say, exon one from one gene and exon three from another gene together. If there's a particular domain in exon one and a different domain in exon three and another gene, they can be brought together by bringing the genes together within an intron, and it can happen at any place within that intron. Since the intron will get cut out, it makes no difference where that happens within the intron. It still keeps the exons completely intact. And so oftentimes we find that domains are localized to exons, but not always. Now, uh, <clears throat> the uh, let's take a little bit closer look at how translation happens. So we've gone through RNA processing. Our messenger RNA molecule has already been made, 5' prime cap added, 3' prime poly A tail, introns taken out, exons spliced together. The messenger RNA now goes out into the nucleus and is ready to be, uh, uh, to be translated. 
Now, there are, uh, we've talked about messenger RNAs. There are two other major types of RNA. There are actually many different types of RNAs, but two ma other major types of RNAs that are involved in translation. So three types, the messenger RNA, which carries the reading frame and the message that will determine what amino acid sequence the protein has. And then the other two types of RNAs, one of them is transfer RNA. And we're going to look at transfer RNA. The, the third one is uh, ribosomal RNA. So messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. They're often to, oftentimes uh, referred to by their uh, abbreviations, tRNA for transfer RNA, rRNA for ribosomal RNA, and mRNA for messenger RNA. And um, let's take a look then at uh, what transfer RNA is like. In fact, we can see all three types of RNAs in this diagram. Here's the messenger RNA down here. Here are the transfer RNAs up here. And then the ribosomal RNAs form a functional part of the ribosome. The ribosome consists of several different ribosomal RNAs that come together with a whole host of ribosomal proteins to make the complete ribosome. So we have all three types of RNAs involved here. Messenger RNA, here are the transfer RNAs right here. Ribosomal RNAs are a structural part of the ribosome. The function of the transfer RNA is to carry the amino acid and ensure that it gets put into the ribosome at the proper place. And the way it does so is the transfer RNA has what's called an anticodon. Remember when we were talking about DNA strands in class, we talked about the sense strand and the antisense strand, so that the antisense strand has the complementary sequence and therefore forms base pairs with the sense strand. Well, we have the same thing going on here. We have the sense of the codons, and then we have the anticodon, which is the complement of it, which we find in the transfer RNA. And therefore, it has three nucleotides that will form base pairs with the codon in the messenger RNA. So here you have UGG, 5 prime to 3 prime. Now remember the 5 prime to 3 prime in the transfer RNA in the anticodon will be backwards compared to the, uh, the, the one that we have here. And uh, so it'll be 5 prime to 3 prime in that direction so that they form anti-parallel base pairing. So in other words, we would then read it CCA, but a more functional way to read it, man, this shuts off so easily. A uh, more functional way to read it is uh, to read it actually back uh, into three prime to five prime orientation. In other words, the reverse of convention because then it reads in the same way that it will pair with the codon there. So we have anti-codon, codon pairing. And then, for instance, here we have the codon UUU, which if you look at your genetic code, what that tells us is that the UUU right here encodes the amino acid phenylalanine. So that any transfer RNA that has the anticodon AAA will carry a phenylalanine on it. And so therefore this transfer RNA, that's how codons, how the amino acids correspond with codons is by having the uh, uh, transfer RNA form, uh, uh, form base pairs with it. And then notice over here the codon GGC encodes glycine, and therefore a transfer RNA carrying the anticodon CCG will form base pairs with it, will bring glycine into that site. Now, within the, uh, within the ribosome, there are uh, three different sites. This site right here is called the E site. This one is called the A site. E site for exit site. P site here, this is called the peptidyl site where the polypeptide is forming. And then this one is called the A site, which is the acceptor site. And uh, the uh, transfer RNA can come in here. So what will happen is that this, tra uh, imagine we're in the middle of elongation right now. Here is a transfer RNA that had a phenylalanine attached to it. This one right here, the codon is UGG, which encodes for tryptophan. And so originally this one had come in this transfer RNA had originally come into this A site. The ribosome then shifted over, formed a peptide bond with the preceding amino acid, 
And now it has shifted over again so that the transfer RNA that has phenylalanine attached to it is in the P site. This one now enters the E site. Its amino acid is gone. It now exits that site. Its amino acid then is this tryptophan here was originally attached to that. In the P site, it has now been attached to the phenylalanine that is attached to this transfer RNA. So imagine this, this little thing right here was originally bonded. And this, by the way, is the end of the RNA molecule. Has, was bonded originally to that, uh, to that tryptophan. And then it now forms, a, as it breaks that bond, as the ribosome breaks the bond between the transfer RNA and its uh, amino acid, it then simultaneously forms a peptide bond to bond it to the phenylalanine that's there so that now this polypeptide, this growing polypeptide is attached here. And then at the same time, the next transfer RNA comes in and the only one that can come in and bond to that is one that carries glycine. And therefore this will come into the A site and then at that point, the ribosome will shift three nucleotides in this direction pushing this transfer RNA then over into that side, breaking the bond with its phenylalanine and simultaneously bonding it to the glycine there uh, so that it can, can carry on that step with e each way as it goes through. Now, uh, this gives you a, an idea of what a transfer RNA looks like. This is what we would call the secondary structure or two-dimensional structure. You'll notice it forms kind of a cloverleaf shape where there are base pairs within four different arms. So that here's where the amino acid is attached to it. Here's where the anticodon is. And then ultimately when it forms its three-dimensional structure, we'll have kind of an L-shape with the amino acid attachment site here, the anticodon over here. And oftentimes we represent them as just kind of an easy symbol like that. But you should be aware that the actual structure of a transfer RNA is this kind of an L shape, amino acid attached here, the anticodon over here. Now, uh, there's an enzyme called aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. What that does is it recognizes there's one of these synthetases for each, uh, for each transfer RNA, and it recognizes that particular type of transfer RNA, and it will only attach the corresponding amino acid to it. So if a transfer RNA has the uh, anticodon AAA, the only amino acid it will attach to it is phenylalanine, because then that transfer RNA will form base pairs with the codon UUU, which encodes phenylalanine, and that's true then for all of the codons there. Now it turns out that since there are 61 codons that encode amino acids, you might think offhand that there have to be 61 different transfer RNAs. Actually, the number of transfer RNA num RNAs number is around 40. And the reason is, is that the third base in the codon can have some, the, the base pairing isn't necessarily as strict there. So if you go to the genetic code, for instance, there are two codons that will encode phenylalanine. If you look up in the upper left-hand corner of it, we'll, uh, 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 in fact, let's scroll back really quickly to the genetic code and take a look at this. If we go back uh, fast as I can do this, Okay, there's our genetic code right there. Notice up in the upper hand corner here that UUU and UUC both specify phenylalanine. It turns out there is only one transfer RNA that carries phenylalanine, but it will form base pairs with both UUU and UUC because the third nucleotide in the codon has some altered base pairing rules with the uh, with the uh, corresponding nucleotide in the anticodon. And so in the anticodon, at these first two positions, you're always going to have AA for a transfer RNA that carries phenylalanine, but the third nucleotide then can form a base pair with both U and C. And in fact, there's an interesting case right here with, say, isoleucine. One transfer RNA encodes for isoleucine, and its third base in the anticodon is actually not even one of the standard four ones. It gets modified to be an, uh, a base called inosine, and inosine will pair with UC and A, and therefore that one anticodon will pair 
with all three, but the first two are very strict. So that the corresponding bases in the antiquote on here are going to be U and A, and then the third one is I, or inosine, which will pair with all three. And therefore, any one of these three codons will pair with the one transfer RNA that carries isoleucine. And that's why you can see in the genetic code that the amino acids are pretty much grouped in here. And so you'll see them uh, grouped here. Anything for threonine, the anticodon will have the first two nucleotides being the same. And then the, four, the third nucleotide then can go through wobble and there can be some altered pairing for that. One of the ones that does not alter is the C that has to be across from the G here. And therefore, things like methionine can have a single transfer RNA that will only pair with AUG. The same thing is true for tryptophan. Notice it's also G there. It will be a C in the anticodon. And there is one transfer RNA that will pair with tryptophan, with the codon for tryptophan. And it has to have a, in the anticodon, has to have A, C, C there. And that's the only thing it will pair with. A C will not, and the anticodon will not undergo wobble at all. And uh, that's why those two will pair only with those two particular amino acids. But it also explains why when we group the codons, that they are grouped where the variation is in the third nucleotide. And you'll notice that's true throughout much of the genetic code. And in cases where it differs, where there are, say, two amino acids in the group of four here, in one case it's the pyrimidines, the single ring nucleotides, and over here it's the purine, the double ring nucleotides. Same thing up here, same thing over here, same thing here, same thing here. In other words, this gives us some of the chemical logic that goes on within the genetic code, which explains why the genetic code is organized as it is, and a lot of that has to do with the way that anticodon codon pairing occurs during translation. Okay, let's go back to where we were a bit earlier with uh, translation. Okay, what this shows, and we'll just go through this one really quickly, is the, uh, the process for attaching an amino acid to the transfer RNA. The amino acid uses ATP, or it uses, the enzyme uses ATP to do this. And in fact, here's a three-dimensional model of the way this whole thing happens. There's the amino acid. It's catalyzing that reaction. This is the enzyme that does it, uh, where it attaches the amino acid onto the end of it. And then at this point, we say that the transfer RNA is charged. Here it's uncharged. It is now charged with this amino acid. It's now ready to go into the ribosome and be used. Now, what the ribosomes do is that they will, the amino acids will try to come into that A side of the ribosome. And uh, they, as they do, the only ones that can actually fully come in there are the ones that will pair with the codon that happens to be, uh, happens to be located in that site, ensuring then that only the right amino acid will be placed in there because only the transfer RNA that can pair with that codon will come in there. What this slide is telling you about is that there are, that when translation happens, the two ribosomal subunits will as assemble with each other to form the intact ribosome on the messenger RNA. And they do it a little bit differently in bacteria and in uh, uh, eukaryotes. In bacteria, they'll actually assemble right on top of the initiation codon. There's a little sequence upstream from the initiation codon that is the single the signal along with the initiation codon for assembly so that the small and subunit and large subunits will come together in bacteria, assemble there, and then go on through and translate. In eukaryotes, what happens is the small subunit comes in and it attaches to the three prime cap. It then moves along down the RNA until it gets to the initiation codon, the AUG star codon. At that point, the large subunit comes in and then translation can begin at that point. And here's uh, an example of, uh, of, how this, uh, uh, of how this whole process happens, showing you different models. Here's the ribosome with its three sites in it. 
And here it is, here's the, a three-dimensional model of the way it actually works. You'll notice that those sites are pretty small compared to the rest of the ribosome and the uh, messenger RNA threads right through it. And here is a schematic model of it showing what we just looked at a moment ago, the growing polypeptide chain there. What will happen is this ribosome will shift in this direction down here. In fact, let me point at it. It'll go this way down here by three nucleotides, which would then put this transfer RNA into the E site, this one into the P site, leaving the A site open for another transfer charge transfer RNA to come in. As it does that shift, it will then simultaneously form a peptide bond there, break this bond here, and extend the polypeptide by one amino acid. Okay, here's the initiation stage of translation. And this, by the way, is the way it happens in a eukaryote so that you have the small subunit that has gone along down the messenger RNA. It has now reached the start codon. This charged methionyl transfer RNA comes in here. The full ribosome assembles with it so that methionine is there. It's now ready for the next amino acid to come into the A site. That A site is positioned over the next codon, and whatever that codon is will specify which amino acid can now come into that place. So here's the process right here. Here's initiation with the ribosome assembled over the, uh, actually in this case, this is part of the elongation phase because you can see there's a big log one here. If this were initiation, there would only be one amino acid there and that would be methionine and that would be an AUG. At this point, we're in the middle of elongation. These codons over here have specified these amino acids. Here's the proper uh, transfer RNA coming in. Now here's where the, tra the ribosome translocates over as it moves in this direction right here. It will shift that transfer RNA into the E site and as it does, it breaks the bond there and establishes it onto the, uh, the next uh, amino acid which has happened now here. So translocates over, the amino acid leaves, the A site is now open for another amino acid to come in. And that cycle then just repeats itself over and over as the ribosome shifts along down three nucleotides at a time covering the codons. And then eventually the A site will reach one of those three stop codons or termination codons which have no corresponding transfer RNA that can go in there. And when it does, then that's the signal to uh, cease translation. There are proteins called release factors that come in to do this. So here's an example of a release factor coming in, covering the A site, the, uh, uh, the final uh, transfer RNA then is from the, la the codon preceding the stop codon is released. The polypeptide is now released from the ribosome. At that point, the ribosome disassembles into its subunits. The messenger RNA is free. Now, by the way, there will be other ribosomes following right along behind this one that will then reach it and do the same thing as, uh, as when the ribosome reaches that, uh, that stop codon it's now ready to disassemble and release the, the polypeptide. Now, in fact, that's what this slide talks about is what are called polyribosomes. All that is, is just a long chain of ribosomes on the same messenger RNA making multiple copies of the same protein. Now, think about this for a moment. What this means is that there are messenger RNAs, multiple messenger RNAs being made off of the same gene. So one gene can have lots of RNA polymerases running along in a chain along it, making multiple copies of messenger RNAs, and then each of those goes outside of the nucleus, and there are multiple ribosomes on them, and so we have an exponential increase in the, uh, in the number of, uh, of uh, polypeptides that can end up, being made, end up being made from one gene. And here's an example of that. This shows a drawing of these <coughs> polyribosomes along here. Here's an electron micrograph showing you the same thing. And on some of these, you can't really see it very well on this. 
but sometimes you can actually see, even see, I think that's one right here, you can see the little tails of the polypeptide coming off of, uh, of each of the ribosomes. Now, once the polypeptide is made then, it's now not ready to carry out its function as a protein. In fact, it usually has to be transported in the cell to the site where it will be used, or in some cases even transported outside of the cell so that it can be used there. So after it's synthesized, the chain will actually, because of its chemical structure and the places the amino acids are and the R groups that are in there, it will form a, it'll fold into its three-dimensional shape. In other words, it will initially assume its secondary structure forming these alpha helices, and then uh, it will also then, those will fold back on themselves to give the tertiary structure. And then if there are more than two polypeptides that, or two or more polypeptides that come together, they will assemble to form the quaternary structure of that protein. Also, some proteins have to re require some sort of modification. A lot of times, pieces of the protein get cleaved off so that it's not the entire polypeptide. But uh, for instance, many times polypeptides will have a, uh, what's called a signal peptide, which is the, remember we talked about that in, you saw it in some of your earlier exams, that they will be very high in hydrophobic amino acids, which that signal peptide will then embed itself into the endoplasmic reticulum, <clears throat> allowing the polypeptide then to go inside of the endoplasmic reticulum as it's being made, and then the signal peptide gets cut off. So it's not part of the final protein. Insulin, for instance, is a very long polypeptide, or a kind of a long polypeptide, but it gets cut down to a very small one. It makes, in fact, has two polypeptides. The middle, uh, an end section is cut off, the other end is cut off, and then the middle part is cut out. And then there are two parts that come together to form the functional insulin molecule. So proteins are often modified after they're, uh, after they're formed. And uh, things like the signal peptide can target a polypeptide to a particular place within the cell. <coughs> In fact, here it talks about that uh, signal peptide, which is usually on the very first, is the first part of the protein that gets translated. That is, it's encoded for near the phi prime end of the messenger RNA. And it, which, uh, by the way, polypeptides, just like an RNA ha and DNA strands, have a 5' prime and a 3' prime end. Proteins have what's called an amino end and a carboxyl end. You know, the, where the amino group is, and then the amino acids are attached, and on the other end is the carboxyl end. And they are translated off of the mRNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and in the protein that ends up being amino to carboxyl in there. So on the amino end is where you'll find the signal peptide for those that have a signal peptide, which then embeds itself into the endoplasmic reticulum. That's represented in uh, this slide right here. Here's the signal peptide coming off, which has hydrophobic amino acids in it. And then this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, signal, uh, what do they call it? Signal receptor protein, I think. Yeah, signal recognition particle uh, comes in and binds to that signal peptide that helps direct it to the endoplasmic reticulum where the signal peptide then remains embedded in the endoplasmic reticulum. The rest of the protein is then added into it and then the signal peptide gets cut off. The protein folds back up on itself and now it can be transported within the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Whew, no, it's not coming up for us there. It's transported through the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum until it reaches its site. Uh, hold on just a minute. I have this room scheduled till 4 o'clock for a video that I'm doing for my class. That's really funny because I've had an ongoing scheduling with Kathy. Yeah, okay, okay, Kathy, you're going to give it to me. Let me shut this off. And you know what? I'll just go. I'll just, nobody's, like, the students are just studying in the other one. Let me just kick them out of that. Okay, thanks. Sorry, it looks like somebody double booked this room, but uh, we've got it, uh, uh, got it set up now to work fine. Okay, uh, 
Uh, the last part of this chapter that we're going to talk about is a very important part. It's one that you're going to see as we get into your uh, practice exam, and that has to do with, uh, uh, with mutations in DNA and what they do. Uh, what they are is, uh, they're, as we've talked about earlier, they're changes in the DNA sequence that end up being inherited. And as you can imagine, a change in the DNA sequence then can get transcribed into an RNA molecule, and that change then has the potential to change the amino acid sequence of a protein, which ultimately can change the function of that protein, and that in turn gives us the variations, that we, the outward variations that we see that are inherited as the phenotypes in individuals. Now, uh, there are a number of different types of mutations, and we'll look at several of them here. Point mutations, it says, are chemical mutations in just one pair, one base pair of a gene. That's uh, the actual definition, that's not quite correct. Point mutations can be a few adjacent nucleotides too. So if, let's say two nucleotides are, uh, two adjacent nucleotides are, uh, are deleted. That would also be an example of a point mutation. The difference being that, that mutations that are not point mutations usually have large deletions or duplications or major changes in the DNA molecule, whereas point mutations are much more restricted and can usually affect just uh, oftentimes just one amino acid, although as we'll see in a moment, a deletion or insertion of nucleotides can change the reading frame and therefore completely change what a protein is from that point on. So let's take a look at some examples now of mutations in DNA and what they do. Here's a common example of a, what we call a substitution mutation. And what it does here is here's the original hemoglobin DNA it has this sequence right here. This happens to be the sixth codon in the gene. And what it does is it produces GAA will be the, uh, see here's the, uh, this is the template strand. This then is the sense strand of the DNA. It gives you a GAA codon. GAA encodes the amino acid, the glutamic acid. And now what happens here is that a mutation has changed this TA base pair to an AT base pair. And it's not flipped it around. What's actually happened here is that a mistake during DNA replication has altered the, uh, uh, has altered the uh, nucleotide sequence and so it has put the wrong nucleotide across from it during DNA replication and ultimately it ends up being now an AT base pair instead of a TA base pair. It could uh, just as well have been something else. But what that does now is it puts in the codon GUA which then substitutes the amino acid valine in there. Now we can call the, there are a number of names for this mutation. One of them is that it's a substitution mutation. A substitution mutation means it substitutes one nucleotide pair for another. In this case, an AT pair is substituted for a TA pair. It has not changed the reading frame at all, but it has changed it. We also call this a missense mutation, meaning that it has changed the amino acid. A missense mutation changes the amino acid. On the other hand, if let's say it had changed this TA base pair right here to a CG base pair, well it turns out GAA and GAG, which is what the other one would have been here, both called glutamic acid. So even though we have a substitution mutation there in that third position, it is not a missense mutation. It's what we call a same sense mutation, or as sometimes I think your textbook calls it a silent mutation. A mutation has happened, but because the two different codons that result there encode the same amino acid, it doesn't change the protein at all. And there are many known cases of that, of mutations that happen in DNA, get inherited, but they have no effect whatsoever on the protein. And therefore we call them a miss, I mean a same sense or a uh, or a silent mutation. But this is an example then of a missense substitution mutation that has changed one amino acid, glutamic acid, to valine. Now, if you look at uh, what actually happens in hemoglobin is this glutamic acid sits on the surface of the protein where it, because it's acidic, it's hydrophilic, and it allows that hemoglobin to remain dissolved in water. 
But if you look at valine, valine is a hydrophobic amino acid. So in this mutated version of hemoglobin, what happens is the valine sits out on the surface. It's not hydrophobic enough to prevent the, the hemoglobin from dissolving well in water, but what it does do is it now has a hydrophobic amino acid that's sitting out there. The pocket where oxygen goes, if you remember oxygen molecules are hydrophobic because you've got two oxygen atoms that are equally pulling with each other and so those covalent bonds between them are completely nonpolar and therefore the oxygen molecule is hydrophobic. The pocket in hemoglobin where it can fit is therefore lined by hydrophobic amino acids and what happens in sickle cell anemia is that this hemoglobin with a valine sticking out of it, that valine can go in and occupy the site where the oxygen should be in another hemoglobin molecule and then the same thing happens to it and the same thing happens to the next one and so on. They build big long chains and they distend the uh, red blood cells so that it becomes sickled. And that's how sickle cell anemia can happen. A single substitution mutation substitutes one amino acid for another. And uh, it can result in a very serious uh, genetic disorder, in this case, of uh, uh, sickle cell anemia. Okay, there are a number of these sorts of small scale or point mutations. One of them is the uh, nucleotide pair substitution that we just saw. Another is where one or more nucleotide pairs are inserted or deleted. And so uh, uh, here we've talked about some of these mutations. A nucleotide pair substitution replaces one nucleotide with another pair. Silent mutations are those that have no effect on the amino acid sequence. Missense mutations will still code for an amino acid, but not the correct one. And also, technically, a missense mutation is anything that changes the, the, the protein. So uh, there are a lot of different missense mutations. This definition that your book gives is, uh, is a bit restricted because there are missense mutations that don't code for an amino acid. And an example of those are what are called nonsense mutations. And a nonsense mutation is one where the mutation changes the codon into one of the stop codons. And what that does is it means then translation will stop prematurely at that point, truncating the polypeptide that gets produced. So if you have, say, a tryptophan mutation, which is UGG, that gets changed to, say, UGA, that's tryptophan. What would be tryptophan there now becomes a stop codon. UGA is a stop codon. That would be an example of a nonsense mutation where that tryptophan would normally go and translation would continue. When the ribosome hits that mutated one that is now a stop codon, it will stop translation at that point and the polypeptide is shortened, meaning that the protein will no longer function. So nonsense mutations are like it says here, nearly always lead to a non-functional protein, and that's because they truncate the protein. Now, here's an example of a, of a silent mutation. Notice that uh, glycine is encoded by GGC, and when that's placed with a, uh, a GGT here, then a GGU in the messenger RNA still codes for glycine. Everything is still the same. Here's an example of a missense mutation where the GGC is changed to AGC so that serine is put in the place of glycine. One amino acid is changed. Here's an example of a nonsense mutation where the AAG that encodes lysine is now changed to UAG. That then uh, puts a, a stop code on in that place so that it's now truncated. And then some very important types of mutations are these insertions and deletions. Because all of these other mutations, substitution mutations, don't change the reading frame at all. They just put one, one nucleotide in the place of another. But insertions and deletions have the potential to shift the reading frame, or what we call a frame shift mutation. If there are any if they're anything but a multiple of three, they will do that. If you insert one nucleotide or delete one nucleotide, it now changes the reading frame because it no, it'll still, the ribosome will still read it in groups of three, but because a nucleotide, either one or two nucleotides, is deleted or inserted, it's going to create a frame shift mutation. And here's an example of that. 
Here is uh, uh, methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, according to their corresponding codons. If there's an extra AT paired in here, it now creates a UAA stop codon, and the ribosome will cease translating at that point. What usually happens, by the way, is that it will, the, the insertion or deletion of a nucleotide pair will now cause it to be read in a different frame. And so let's say here, if that, uh, let's say this, this TA pair right here is deleted, it will now read it as AGU, UUG, GCU. And what it means is that from the point of that insertion or deletion, the ribosome now reads in a different frame and you get different amino acids going in it all along and it will keep reading and it also will take the stop codon out of frame. So that what will happen is it will either encounter another stop codon earlier than it should, which truncates the protein, or it might read right on through the original stop codon and go on until it encounters another out of uh, stop codon that was originally out of frame and is now in a new frame so that it could possibly make it longer. A nice example of a frame shift mutation is the allele that causes typo blood. It is exactly the same as the, a, the allele that causes type A blood, except there is a one nucleotide deletion. And what that does is it shifts the reading frame from that point on so that the protein now has a whole different set of amino acids from that point on, and it also encounters a stop codon much earlier than the original stop codon, so it makes the protein shorter. As a consequence, the enzyme that makes the A substance normally now can no longer function, and since it fails to function, it does not add the additional poly, uh, sugar onto the polysaccharide. You end up with uh, 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 you end up with type O blood if the individual is, is homozygous for that mutant allele. And again, it is the most common allele is a mutant allele in ABO blood types among people uh, worldwide. So that uh, uh, if you happen to have type O blood, you have a frame shifted uh, a mutation, a frame shift mutation in your in your gene. Uh, if you're like me, uh, I happen to know that I'm heterozygous, I have type A blood, but that's because I have one copy of the A allele and then the other copy. I inherited the A allele from my father and I inherited the O allele from my mother. I am heterozygous, so one of my alleles contains that frame shifted uh, version. But interestingly, it is that mutated frame shifted version that fails to encode a functional protein that is the most common allele in, in human populations. And so many of you in this classroom are either heterozygous or homozygous carriers of that frame shifted uh, mutation. And obviously frame shifts then don't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily bad, they don't necessarily cause, cause problems because they're what causes type O blood is a, is a frame shift mutation. It's a nice example of that. Okay, here's an example of, uh, of an extensive missense mutation where a uh, nucleotide is deleted and you can see it's now putting different amino acids in from that point on and who knows where it will then encounter a stop code on it might be too early it might be too late it's not likely that it will be at the right place it'll be either earlier or later either truncating or extending the amino acid chain and from the point of the mutation onwards it puts in a whole different series of amino acids and as a consequence completely disrupts the uh, the function of that protein. Now, interestingly, there are known mutations that might be, let's say, a deletion of three nucleotide pairs. Because it's a deletion of three adjacent nucleotide pairs, all that does is remove one codon. And it doesn't shift the reading frame, but it can change the amino acids that are read. So in this case, that lysine is entirely deleted from it. An example of that is uh, cystic fibrosis, which is the most common genetic disorder in people whose ancestry is predominantly uh, Northern European. And uh, the most common mutation that causes that is one that deletes three has deleted three nucleotides from the gene, and it deletes a phenylalanine 
uh, amino acid from the polypeptide, and it does so in the 507th codon. In other words, the 507th amino acid in the polypeptide is a phenylalanine that ends up getting deleted. That is enough to eliminate the function of that protein, and therefore people who are homozygous for that three nucleotide deletion mutation suffer from cystic fibrosis, and yet it has no effect on the subsequent amino acids. It just deletes one amino acid because it's three nucleotides that are deleted. So for a frame shift to happen, it has to be, it, any multiple of three will not, deletion or insertion, will not result in a frame shift, but nonetheless can still alter the protein enough to uh, cause problems, as is the case with uh, uh, the most common mutation that causes cystic fibrosis. So it has to be uh, something that is not a multiple of three. Anything, any deletion or insertion that is not a multiple of three will shift the reading frame. Anything that is a multiple of three, you know, three, six, nine, or so on, can either insert or delete amino acids, but will not shift the reading frame. And there are many known examples of that. Okay, lastly, what is it that causes mutations? Sometimes they're just spontaneous changes in uh, mistakes during DNA replication that don't get repaired. Uh, in other cases, there are certain chemicals that, and those are, by the way, called spontaneous mutations. They just occur as mistakes during DNA replication. There's no particular external factor that is, is responsible for it. It's just a uh, that mistakes occasionally happen, and for the most part, your cell has repair mechanisms that will fix those. But even some of those escape and ultimately end up uh, being inherited as mutations. Uh, but there are also substances called mutagens, which are uh, mutagens, uh, there are chemicals that tend to cause changes in DNA, and there are also uh, radiation that we're exposed to, both uh, uh, what is sometimes called ionizing radiation, examples of that are x-rays or cosmic rays, which is high energy radiation that can penetrate deeply into your tissues, can then cause mutations in the DNA, or cause damage to the DNA, which ultimately ends up in mutations, or what we sometimes call non-ionizing radiation. An example of non-ionizing radiation is ultraviolet light, which does not penetrate deeply and therefore tends to cause mutations in the skin in the cells of the skin, but not deeply, because those ultraviolet rays will not penetrate very deeply into your, into your body, but they are oftentimes responsible for skin cancer. Now, we've talked a little bit earlier that gene expression differs among the various types of life. Bacteria use different types of ribosomes, a different type of RNA polymerase, those sorts of things then. Then we have still the basic concept of the gene is universal. And that is, you can come up with a very simple explanation for a gene. What a gene is, is a segment of DNA that encodes an RNA molecule. Therefore, messenger RNAs are encoded by genes. Also, ribosomal RNAs are encoded by genes, but they will not be translated into a protein and uh, transfer RNAs are encoded by genes as well. Also, the RNAs that are used in the spliceosome to remove the introns, those are encoded by genes. So that RNAs ultimately are encoded by genes, and there are many of different types of genes, and then we can divide them into the different types, you know, into their different subcategories, such as uh, uh, protein encoding genes are ones that make messenger RNAs. You have a little over 20,000 of those in your genome. Then you have ribosomal RNA genes that will produce the ribosomal RNAs, which will then make up the ribosome. They do not encode proteins. And then the transfer RNA genes will make the transfer RNAs, which of course also do not encode proteins, but are, along with ribosomal RNAs, are involved in the process of translation. So that you have many more genes than just the protein encoding genes. But the protein encoding genes are the ones that will produce the enzymes, the structural proteins, all of the proteins that it takes to, uh, to, make, uh, to make a body. The, uh, <clears throat> here are some comparisons that we find, uh, even though genes, with the basic concept of the gene is similar, there are certain differences. <coughs> For instance, bacteria and eukaryotes differ in the type of RNA polymerases they have, the way they terminate transcription, the ribosomes they use, and archaea, 
uh, single cell organisms that are very much like the true bacteria are a little more close to eukaryotes in those respects. Uh, bacteria can simultaneously transcribe and translate the same gene because they don't have a nucleus. Eukaryotes uh, translation and transcription are separated by the nuclear membrane and uh, in archaea they are probably coupled as well as they are in uh, prokaryotes. And then here's an example, this is a very nice one showing the polyribosomes. Here you have a, a gene that starts over here, this is a bacterial gene by the way, ends over here. Here's an RNA polymerase making an RNA, the RNA is coming off, ribosomes are now attached to it. Here's another one, RNA polymerase there, RNA, messenger RNA, the different ribosomes attached to it. And then there are polypeptides coming off of it, you can just barely see one, there's one right there, that's a little polypeptide coming off of that, uh, coming off of that ribosome. And then here's a drawing showing that whole process right here. And then what this slide does is it takes a eukaryote and it puts everything together that we've talked about here, except for mutation. So here you have transcription going on. Here's a gene. Transcription goes on to make a pre RNA molecule or RNA transcript. RNA processing occurs, three steps to that, which is adding the five prime cap, and three prime poly A tail, cutting out the introns, splicing the exons together so that here you have the mature messenger RNA, the five prime cap poly A tail. It goes out here, the ribosome assembles now on the messenger RNA, goes along through the five prime UTR, or untranslated region, until it encounters, actually it's the small subunit that goes along there until it encounters a start codon. At that point it assembles, it starts translating it and ultimately makes the, uh, and by the way that arrow should be pointing this way, that's the direction the ribosome is going, and it will move along through it toward the poly A tail, carrying out translation until it encounters a stop codon. Beyond that is the three prime untranslated region or UTR, and then the poly A tail. Amino acids are being attached to the transfer RNAs, they are then coming in to the sites. The ribosome is translocating three nucleotides at a time, reading the codons and putting in the amino acids to produce a growing polypeptide chain. Any mutation then in the DNA may ultimately have some effect, be trans transcribed into the RNA, which may or may not have an effect on the polypeptide chain, depending on what kind of a mutation it is. If it's a missense mutation, it can, you know, substitution mutation, it can substitute one amino acid for another, leaving all the rest of them the same. If it's a deletion or insertion mutation that's not a multiple of three, it will, can cause a frame shift mutation. If it's a nonsense mutation, it'll cause that polypeptide chain to be cut short. You know, if there's a premature stop codon in there, that's a nonsense mutation that would cut it short. And, uh, uh, or it might just be a same sense mutation or silent mutation where there's no change at all in the polypeptide chain even though there was a mutation in there. The mutation, imagine a mutation in an intron. That's not going to have much of an effect because the intron gets cut out. What about a mutation in the five prime UTR? not likely to have much of an effect because it's not in the reading frame. Same thing with the three prime UTR. Uh, mutations in the promoter sequence out here may or may not have an effect. If they change the promoter so that RNA polymerase can't bind to it, that will shut off the function of the gene. Um, mutations, interestingly, are sometimes known right at the exon intron boundary. At that point, they might prevent an intron from being cut out. And if that happens, that's disastrous because if the intron isn't removed, the ribosome will translate right into an intron and put a whole lot of amino acids that aren't supposed to be there. And if the other end of the intron is out of frame, it results in a frame shift mutation too. So in other words, mutation, the bottom line being that mutations can have all kinds of different effects uh, depending on where they happen and what they do to the messenger RNA and ultimately to the protein that gets encoded by it. Okay, in summary, here's a nice definition of a gene defined as a region of DNA. In fact, another way to think of it is that it's one that will be transcribed into an RNA and it might ultimately end up as a polypeptide. In other words, I'm not quite real fond of this definition 
Think of a gene as any DNA sequence that encodes an RNA molecule. And then some of those, that RNA molecule may ultimately encode a polypeptide. So while it says here either a polypeptide or an RNA molecule, actually it always is a poly, you say always a polypeptide and sometimes an RNA molecule. That is any gene that encodes a messenger RNA will likewise also encode a polypeptide. And that takes us to the end of this chapter. I'm going to go turn off the video and then start it up again. And what we'll do is move on to a review of uh, your practice exam, and that'll be the second video that we'll upload for you.